Okay, welcome to the workshop. We're going to be looking at Wireshark and we're going to be looking at basic networking. So how we're going to do it is we will take the hacker approach and rather than learning and then doing, we're going to do and then, then learn on the go with Wireshark. Um, to enjoy this fully, you will need a device, preferably a laptop, something that runs Wireshark. Uh, you, it would be wise if you would download Wireshark, Wireshark now already. I see some recognizable faces, so there are some knowledgeable people here, um, and I'm sure those of you who I don't recognize also are knowledgeable. Please help your neighbors to install Wireshark. It's Wireshark.org, right? So you have it all. If you don't have a laptop, um, it may be less interesting for 30% of the talk, but 70% is going to be me talking, right? Okay. But, having said that, even though it's a hacker approach, I come from an academic background, so the goal of this talk is to make you really, really, really understand all the layers of networking and how it all adds up and how internet works. Okay. So, this is, these are actually two models of how networking works. And we're going to go through the layers one by one. What this represents, oh, how many of you know what the, an IP, sorry, how many of you know what an IP address is? Okay, how many of you have, and aren't sure what an IP address is? And that's okay, that's what this workshop is aimed for. One, some more, okay, okay, good. <coughs> so, how many of you have seen a similar picture to this one before? Okay, a bit more than half. Okay, good. So, but this is a... I tried to make it beginner's one. Okay, but let's, let's do it like that. Righty. So, the wire or the network medium is down here. What this represents, actually, is the different ways or different dissectors that we can use to look at the data on the network. If we take good old classical wired network, this is where the wire goes, this is where your electrical signals go, or your optical signals. And different encodings are used to encapsulate the data up to the user. So, for this picture, and we're going to see it again today, you can imagine the user or yourself on the top, <coughs> where you're sitting at the keyboard, in your browser, at your, in your email client, and the physical medium, the wire or the Wi-Fi on the very bottom, okay? And we will get back to that. So what we're going to be talking about are the network layer models. We're going to take a look at Ethernet. We're going to take a look at Wi-Fi. It's going to take three hours. Uh, we're going to take a look at layer three protocols. Those are layers, the seven layers in, in one of the models. But we're going to take a look at that. Uh, we're going to look at ARP, ICMP, IPv4, IPv6. We're going to look at layer four UDP and TCP. <coughs> How many of you aren't sure or don't know at all the difference between UDP and TCP? If I ask you to explain how many of you could not do, the, do that or would, wouldn't be sure if they could do that? Okay, we have beginners here. Great! <laughs> cool. I really love that. Okay. We're going to have a quick peek at routing, I think, if I didn't remove that from this deck. Uh, and finally, application level protocols. Do you actually know the common thing between SMTP, which is used to send your mails online, and the post office? The return address is whatever you write on the envelope. It's the same for SMTP, same for email. You're going to look at that. And of course, the advanced stuff, punching holes in firewalls, breaking VPA2, and much more, because we have a lot of time. <coughs> right, the approach. Academic approach, and at the same time hacker approach. I already covered this, but we'll look at what we see. We'll try to understand it deeply enough, and we'll try to make it fun. Please make sure all of you have Wireshark who have laptops here. Should first ask questions later. <coughs> and the first thing we do is uh, we get to know Wireshark. So we're not going to go deep right now. We're just going to take a quick peek, and then we're going to discuss what we see, and then we're going to go deeper in all the protocols. Right. Uh, I didn't tell you what network is. Is there is there a need to explain what network is? Uh, network is generally more than one connected devices. It's a very general definition because it doesn't have to be computer network. It, it, it can be USB and, and, and all that. And Wireshark, as we will see, 
is actually quite good at capturing different protocols, not only network protocols, right? But computer network is basically uh, a network that's made up of these layers that we uh, looked previously. Okay, I'm gonna sit over there, I'm gonna open Wireshark, and I'm gonna show you some stuff. Okay. Is it, uh, it's not all louder? Louder, yes? Loud enough? Okay. <coughs> hmm, I think I, I ought to clean my Wireshark settings, not to show stuff. Anyway, so Wireshark is an application that is used to analyze network traffic, uh, to visualize network traffic. It can also be used to capture network traffic. I should have had Wireshark folder. Okay, whatever. Let's just let's just launch it. There will be some files in there, but it doesn't matter. Oh, it goes it goes in there. Um, Let me set the screens up for us. Okay, should be there now. Right, so this is a, actually a clean clean copy of Wireshark. Depending on what version you got and what operating system you got, it might look a bit differently. But the common thing is you have a filter entry here, it allows you to enter filters. Uh, you have interfaces here. Uh, some operating systems are really picky about getting you, giving you access to the actual network interfaces. Uh, if you don't see them, uh, this graph doesn't show up in all the versions, right? If you don't see them, ask a neighbor to enable the capturing for you. You will have time to do that. Anyway, this is gen general interface. And one thing, one thing I can suggest even to pros. Look, if I if I click on the interface, it starts ca it starts capturing the data. Um, yeah, let's let's capture it. Whatever. So this is my data that's on the wire. And. Uh, it's not it's not so easy to see because you you, you you have these different parts and we can talk about them. What I suggest everyone do is go to preferences, edit preferences, and uh, in layout under appearance, select the second layout. It's much easier to work with, right? Then we have it like here. Uh, w why is this good? Because the left side and the right side now is showing the same information, different view, which is much better. Uh, so edit preferences, appearance. And then layout, and you take the second, second option there. If you don't like it, you can switch back. Okay, so we will talk about what all these numbers and all these letters mean in a moment. But what you need to know now, and if I'm going too fast, please, uh, please let me know. We have time, at least for now. On the top, we have. Uh, well, you better not. But you can, and it, it's if you run Wireshark as uh, so. The question is, uh, the question was, uh, would you have to run Wireshark as a pseudo? Uh, so it's not advisable, but it solves many problems at once, creating some other bigger problems. But uh, it does it does get the job done. Uh, why don't you run Wireshark as sudo? Uh, Wireshark not only captures data from the network, which it needs privileges for, but it also processes them. And these so-called dissectors, which allow you to visually see what you see on the left here. Um, so each line here is provided by a different dissector. 
it actually allows you to see what's inside the protocol. And you can take a look at that later, much later on. Uh, are written by many different people, lots of them. And there are bugs. And you don't want bugs in your program you run as root, right? Especially if it's taking live data from the network, uh, all the data. Anyway, if there are no more questions at this point, let me continue. So on top we have each frame, each packet, it depends on what, what that is, but basically each piece of incoming data on the wire we have here on top. On the left in this view, we have dissected data. So it's processed data and we can take a look at what's what. On the right we have raw data, this is the whole frame. And the cool thing about this is if you click anywhere on the right, it will show you the matching part on the left. So it actually shows you which byte is what. This is quite cool. But we don't know what that is, right? It's uh, it's some jumbo mumbo or mumbo jumbo. Let's uh, let's get back to the presentation. We're going to work with that a bit. Let me switch back. It'll be quicker than previously. Okay. So for capturing data locally, that's what I just did. Um, for this workshop, I hope your neighbors will help you up setting this up. But then you do that at home, and usually it's it's useful after after you've been to a workshop to go back at home and 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 try to repeat it, so you actually don't forget it. Uh, different hardware. If you want to capture the data on the wire, not only data that goes to your computer. For example, now I capture the data that goes to my computer. If you can capture capture all the data that is received by the network interface by layer one. Uh, you need to make sure to enable promiscuous mode. Um, and it means that your network card does not drop packets that are not addressed to you, or frames that are not addressed to you. Um, that means you can get to see other stuff on the network or on, on the Wi-Fi. Uh, we're going to probably take a look at that later on in, in two hours. Network card drivers have to support this feature. Uh, most do. If they don't, for example, for, uh, for Wi-Fi, I recommend... Uh, I recommend these TP links. Quite, quite good. This is TLWN722N. Uh, it's it's only 2.4 gigs, but uh, it gets the job done. If your built-in do not support it, Wireshark can also be used to capture other network data, like USB data, GSM data. Um, some of these may require additional tools, meaning that you will not usually be able to capture GSM with Wireshark directly, but there's a Cool project, Osmocom, which you can, uh, who knows Osmocom? Some do, good. Which you can install and configure, it's a pain, but it uh, it works nicely after you do that and you have the right hardware. Of course, you can't do that with this one. This is 2.4 gigahertz. GSM is uh, just under gigahertz. And then you can capture it and, and dissect it. Right. Just to cover a bit more advanced stuff now, we are not gonna try it, but you might be interested in, it in the future. So let's say you have larger network, or let's say you are not at the network at the time at all, you're in a different place, and you want to capture the data remotely, or rather you want to dissect the data remotely, you want to take a look at it. Uh, for example, you're renting a server in, in a server room somewhere in uh, Amsterdam, and you're not from Netherlands, um, and you need to debug what the hell is happening there. You have multiple options depending on the network between where you're capturing and where you are. So if you're close, you can use port mirroring. That's a feature on switches where you say, I want all the other ports from the switches, so the holes you plug the wire in, right? Uh, go to this port too. And then you also get the data. Uh, so if you're on local network, that's a, that's a feature you can use to get to the data. You can use uh, some protocol. For example, Tasman sniffer protocol can be used, and that can be used over long distances. I think it's UDP, meaning it might lose some data. And what it means, we'll get to that in, in, in some moment. Uh, but it basically forwards everything to an IP address on the internet, so it can be used over longer distances. But it's not encrypted. In case um, you're okay with not getting live data, you can use the command down below, TCP dump. This specific command, what what would it do? This specific command would uh, would take interface called Ethernet zero, Eth zero, and 
write all the data without size limitation. So 64 k is, is the largest size you can have uh, without size limitation to file block dot cap or dot pcap. And then you could open that file with Wireshark. Let me show you that right now. Thank you so much. So let me stop this here. Um, so my interface here is uh, VLAN zero. I don't have uh, I don't have Ethernet uh, connected currently because I was running the speaker desk the whole day. Uh, but um, let's go here. Let's, let's delete the program stuff from here. Whoops. Right. Um, so it needs it needs sudo, of course because it needs to capture from the interface and TCP dump. Then we specify the interface, which is VLAN zero for this case. Um, have you heard of systemd? Yeah? Uh, systemd has this cool feature where interfaces are called uh, something like something like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you can turn it off, actually. Uh, I, I did. Cool, no? Uh, I, if, if some of you don't know how to do it, I mean, I don't remember how I did it. Uh, it's it's somewhere there. Look look it up online. Anyway, uh, it specifies the maximum size here and the file you write it to, and the secret passphrase. It's secret one two three. If you oh sorry, never mind. <coughs> Permission denied. Okay. What's happening here? <laughs> okay, so apparently, apparently permissions for my RAM disk don't allow root to write there. Whatever, however that happened. Uh, okay, uh, so currently I'm writing uh, to test cap. I think that's enough. Now, when you launch Wireshark, you can also click file open here. You can go to your TMP folder. Uh, test cap, here it is. You open it up. And there we have it. We have basically the same information, same layout, but it's not real time. And this time here on the left is relative to the start of TCP dump, not relative to start of Wireshark. And uh, we have stuff here, right? We also have visual clue here. This is a feature of the newer versions. If you have an older one, you will not have this on the right. It represents what you have on the left, but but you see everything. Um, okay, we still some of you, most of you, probably still don't know what the hell all this is about. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna move forward and talk about what this is about. This is gonna be the most academic part of the workshop. So if you are an academic or like academics, this is the time for you to listen carefully. Okay, I should have put a nicer wallpaper. I'm gonna do that for tomorrow's talk. Right, so these are these are the models. ISA OSI model is on the left there. It consists of seven layers of encapsulation of the way to look at data. The DOD4 model is on the very right. It says network, internet, host to host and process. There's just four layers. It doesn't mean that anything on the network changes. If you look at, I mean, if you have the data, it's there. It doesn't mean that stuff changes. It's just a different way to look at it, okay? And what do layers actually mean? What do they represent? So if you connect a measurement device to a networking medium on the very bottom, you will have some kind of signal. For example, you might you might see electronic signal on the Ethernet wire. You might see optical signal, intensity of light on optical wire. For radio signals, you might listen on a specific frequency and you might also hear some intensity on specific frequency and the frequencies around it. That's all there and all the layers are in there. The question is, 
which layer do we look at? How do we interpret the data? The data doesn't change depending, the data on the wire does not change depending on the layer that we are looking at, okay? And I hope you will understand at the end of this presentation what are the reasons for having the layers and, and, and looking at them more differently. Okay, we're going to use the uh, academic model, the isa OSI model for this presentation. Uh, DOD model basically, it's it's more down to errors. It's, it's a bit more simple. It, it, it encapsulates, uh, sorry, it joins multiple layers together in, in, in less layers because uh, even even when working with uh, isa OSI model, these three layers, uh, you can see they're in the same color. It's hard to distinguish them at times depending on what the protocols are. The great success of the model, and the model does not influence what's on the wire, but it influences how academics and practitioners create protocols for the internet. They look at the model, and the great success of the model is that it's layered, meaning you can basically swap up, swap up, swap out one layer, and everything else can remain the same. For example, if we swap up the swap out the physical layer, um, we can still have an IP address. It doesn't matter if you have Wi-Fi or if you have wire, or if you have optic optic cable, you still have the same IP addresses. Theoretically, for DNS, for example, domain name system, we can look at that later. We can swap up the swap out the transport layer. We can change UDP to TCP, and we still have basically the same protocol on top on layer five, and same protocols below on layer three and, and down. Each layer can be swapped out mostly independently, meaning that internet can evolve. We can create new protocols, and it's easy enough. There are some bigger projects uh, doing some some larger stuff where they want to replace the whole stack. It's a bit more complex than that, but that's a great success. Moving moving data from the user on top <coughs> to the wire on bottom is called encapsulation. <coughs> there is one encapsulation step between each pair of layers. So going from layer seven to layer six, there is encapsulation. Six to five, there is encapsulation. Five to four, and so on. <coughs> Technically, you only need to have the lowest layers. So let's say we capture data at a specific moment in time. We measure the voltage on, on the wires. It has to have physical layer because we measure the voltage, that is the physical layer. If the voltage makes sense in, say, Ethernet sense, um, we can also interpret that it, at it as layer two. If that Ethernet frame contains IP protocol, it's layer three and so on, but it doesn't have to go all the way up. As we will see in the example with Scapy, it can stop at any time. Physical layer is there, depending on what data is in there, and you can, if you have Wireshark on, you can take a look at the data that you can capture. Some dissect, uh, some packets will show you only up to a specific layer. <coughs> right. So let's say I was typing an email. I, I typed my body, my text that I want to send, and I press send. So what all the applications and all the firmware in your computer does together, it encapsulates it down to physical layer, and then the network card takes the raw bits, zeros and ones, and creates a signal out of them, depending on what kind of physical layer you're on. Encapsulation usually includes adding a header to data from the upper layer. So let's say your email text was really short. Let's say it was hello SHA, right? Hello, space SHA. Encapsulating it one by one, well, layer by layer, you would add additional data. It's it's usually binary data, so I can't really pronounce it to you. But let's, for for the sake of argument, let's take it. Let's take some simple numbers. At the transport layer, it might be seven seven seven. Hello, SHA. At the next layer, it might be three five six seven 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 hello sh it will add more and more data more and more metadata with every encapsulation for some layers it will also add check sequences it depends on the specific protocols that we're going to look at but there are check sequences that 
ensure that the data of the upper layer has not been corrupted when being transferred. So this is basically encapsulation. If, if anyone asks you what encapsulation is, it means taking the upper layer data, adding some stuff to it, and then passing it down to the lower layer. There's one more thing, decapsulation. Anyone knows or thinks they know what that is? Right, decapsulation is a process the other way around. You have your you have your bits here. They're decoded and then they're decapsulating. You check the uh, check the check sequence if there is any. You ch you do what you need to do with the headers. Sometimes, for example, the promiscuous mode. Right, you remember that. If you don't have it on your network card, check the header, check the MAC address. We're gonna talk about the MAC address later, and discards the frame and doesn't pass up. It discards it depending on what the metadata here is. So something is done with the header, and if it's all fine, the data is passed up. Um, please watch me carefully. So this data here decapsulates to this here. So all this is considered data on the lower layer. Again, uh, all this, uh, sorry, all all this is considered data on the lower layer, right? Encapsulation and decapsulation. Okay. Um, shortly back to the academic part of the presentation. Correct names for the packet data units for each layer are physical layer, those are bits, data link is frame, network is packet, and transport is segment. Uh, and here just data. Just in case you were wondering. Uh, technically, with what I do here today, you might be able to pass half of CCNA one course. You can try the exam later on. <coughs> So I don't have much to say about the physical layer. I mentioned the uh, different physical. I'm gonna walk around so everyone can see. I'm, I mentioned different physical layers um, multiple times already. So academic definition of physical layer is that the goal of it is to specify the electrical, mechanical, procedural, and functional requirements for activating, maintaining, and deactivating a physical link between and systems. There are some keywords there that are actually important and actually make sense. Actually, <laughs> all of it makes sense to me. Uh, but electrical means physical layer deals with voltage levels. It, it deals with which voltage level is zero, which one is one. Physical means it deals with what kind of socket there is. So if you want to plug in a cable in a, in a port, sockets have to match, right? And so on. The physical link between end systems means that physical layer only works between systems on the same network. With wire, it's simple. You have wire, e each wire has how many ends? Two. And if you cut in half? One. You cut, a, you cut a wire that has two ends in half, how many ends do you have? You still have two ends. Four ends. You have four ends. <coughs> anyway, because you got two wires. <coughs> so, no, that's ju just a small joke. Sorry about that. <coughs> okay, so a wire, however, how many times you cut in half only connects two systems, right? So it's it's a physical link between two systems, two network interfaces, two cards. Uh, it's a bit different with wireless, but wireless still we can talk about physical link. We have an access point, and we have all the devices that are physically connected to that interface using that medium. Medium for wireless is the radio spectrum. It's basically the electromagnetic bandwidth available for using for using the radio. And it's it's that physical link between end systems. So on the physical layer alone, we cannot transmit further than the physical cable goes. If we put a switch in between in order to make a cable larger, the physical layer ends with a switch. Switch, by the way, is called the layer two device because it operates on layer two. We're gonna look, take a look at layer two right now, and we're gonna see what that what that is. A switch is layer two device. It breaks down layer one and it operates at layer two. It also breaks down layer two, <coughs> but it recreates it for communication to happen. Oh, we're still looking at layer one. Sorry about that. 
So layer one actually consists of two sublayers. Continuing with the academ academic part here. Uh, the data link layer is responsible for delivering the messages to the proper device. Meaning that there's some kind of identifier in the data, data link layer that can be used by networking equi equipment to route, well, route is not the correct term, uh, but to manage the direction of the data. No, this is layer two, my apologies. Yes, layer two. Right, layer two consists of data link layer and, uh, and the Mac layer. So data link layer also formats the message into data frames and adds a header. And it contains these addresses. It contains the destination address and the source address. Now, only for Ethernet, only for Ethernet those are called MAC addresses. Only for Ethernet. There are different layer two protocols than Ethernet. Ethernet is the most accessible one for most of us. And data link layer consists of these two layers, MIDI X control and logical link control. Ethernet is one of the protocols that can be used on layer two. Here is uh, a small example on your right. It's a so-called Manchester encoding. How many of you know what Manchester encoding is? Cool, we have uh, four and a half pros. Nice. <coughs> um, but the real question is, why is it used? I mean, I, I, I don't want to talk about Manchester encoding uh, per se, because it's, uh, it's actually used up to 100 megabits wired, if I'm not mistaken, 100 megabit desert, 100 base T. Um, so it's not, not, not so popular anymore. Uh, but uh, the idea is good, and it can be used when designing protocols of such a low level. The idea behind Manchester encoding is to build in a clock into data. So what is a clock for low-level protocols? Remember, we have these two devices. Let's take a simple case. We have these two devices with wire in between them. And the device A wants to send the device B data 10100111001, right? What if device A wanted to send 1,000 zeros in a row? How would device B know that those are 1,000 zeros, not 1,001 zero? What if they wanted to send a million zeros? Clocks between devices may not match. Clock speed may not match, and it was specifically a problem back in the day and even currently be between different manufacturers, it is possible for oscillation frequencies on the chips to not match. <coughs> to fix that, uh, an encoding can be used. One of the simplest schemes is called the Manchester encoding. And as you can see, it takes a clock of the sending device. It has its clock and it wants to synchronize its clock to the receiver so the receiver knows how many zeros or ones are being received. And it's quite simple, really. <coughs> For each clock, we have one bit. So clock is on and off, right? The first line. We have one bit. And <coughs> if the bit is one, it means change the signal level on the wire. This is signal level on the wire. Like, y you, can, you can look at it as uh, uh, minus five and plus five volts, which is not, not correct, but you can look at it like that. Change the level on the wire from minus five to plus five. <coughs> and for every zero, change the level on the wire from plus five to minus five. And what do we have in the end? In the end, we have oscillations all the time. So if you have multiple ones, we go down and we go back up. If you have multiple zeros, we go up and we go back down. That way, clock gets built in into data stream. It's a, it's a good principle that can be used in many, many places, right? This way, receiver always knows how many sequential zeros or ones are being sent. <coughs> Anyway, this was a bit deep. Uh, let's look at the MAC address. This is something you actually need to use Wireshark correctly. <coughs> so on, on, on layer two, if it's Ethernet, you have a MAC address. It's six bytes, and it's represented by six hexadecimal symbol pairs. Examples on the screen. That's, uh, I think I just made that address up, yeah. Just I just ask the random number generator and, and there's an address. <coughs> First three bytes are what's called organizationally unique oh yeah, organizationally unique identifier. It's assigned by IEEE 
to different vendors of network equipment, including network cards. Well, then there are some people to the east, uh, some countries to the east, who just uh, take them randomly and create whatever others they like. Uh, but it, they should be globally unique, theoretically, but it's not such a huge thing because, remember, layer two only matters locally. Even a switch is layer two device, and then MAC addresses do not matter because we get a new set of MAC addresses, even though theoretically they should be unique. A first byte that 0, 08 is the first byte in this example. First byte is has to end with two zeros in binary, meaning that it has to be divisible by four in decimal. If it's not, then bad stuff happens. Why? Take a look at Wikipedia. It it says that. We don't have that much time. <coughs> Last three bytes. I mean, if if you if you know everything I'm 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 talking about, right? You can do your deeper deeper research right now, so you not get bored. Uh, Last three bytes are vendor assigned, meaning that if I have a company and I register with IEEE to get uh, prefix uh, 081 ec 7 then I can randomly or sequentially assign these numbers to my network e equipment and give them out to customers. And again, these are used to identify devices on the local network. Oh, we're also gonna, let's take a look at Wi-Fi here. Because Wi-Fi is, 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 is basically one of, one of uh, options for the lower layer. This is a neat table I, I put together. Uh, so we have different Wi-Fi standards. We have different frequencies for them. And we have different maximum speeds. <coughs> Currently, the newest standard that was approved is actually um, a oh AD was a new standard was, that was approved. I think the year here in this table, if I remember correctly, when putting this together, means the year it the first device became actually available uh, for the specific standard. So 60 gigahertz stuff hasn't really worked out yet, but it promises up to uh, almost seven gigabits per second of Wi-Fi. Mm, cool. <coughs> Modulation is another cool thing. Uh, so OFDM, for example, means orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, which is uh <laughs> which is how uh, how the radio spectrum is used uh, to to put the data in. Um, let me give you a simple example. This is quite complex. It it has some uh, trig trigonometry in it and. Uh, Let's look at frequency modulation, FM radio. You have heard about that, right? Frequency modulation means that to encapsulate data, or let's say your voice, into uh, the radio frequency, change in uh, the pitch of your voice will, will create the change in actual frequency. So there's a carrier frequency, for example, 100 megahertz. And I'm g gonna exaggerate the numbers here. But to send one kind of data, uh, the frequency will shift to 101 megahertz. To send another kind, it will shift to 99 megahertz, right? That's frequency modulation. <coughs> uh, then there's amplitude modulation. None of these are used in in, uh, in Wi-Fi because they're a bit too simplistic. Amplitude modulation works with amplitude, meaning we have our frequency, we stay there as a transmitter, and we change the strength of the signal. And depending on what data we want to send, we change how strong we are sending it, right? And these, all of these, I think, yeah, combine both these techniques and more to work. <laughs> Then there's Wi-Fi wi security. Hmm. I actually have a cool slide. I should have put it in here. Uh, <coughs> that shows how many Wi-Fi networks in the world by percentage have which kind of <coughs> security. We have quite a lot of non-encryption Wi-Fi's, which is okay because we have some public Wi-Fi, some cafes where you would like to check your bank account or the bank account of the person sitting next to you. <coughs> <coughs> we have, uh, uh, but but we have these. WEP Wi-Fi, which is a great encryption scheme. It's it's called uh, how's how is it called? Uh, wireless and en enhanced privacy. Okay, equivalent privacy. Oh uh, yeah. So it was created some time ago, and it can be cracked on my laptop in an active mode, meaning that you send out packets in under half a second. <coughs> in passive mode, it might take up to a couple minutes. Super, super scheme. So we're not gonna crack that. We're gonna, we're gonna crack VPA2 later on. <coughs> That's more fun. Um, 802.1x. At this conference here, for those of you who read the booklet carefully, you're using probably the right network, which has 800.1x encryption. 
Meaning that, well, a user can tell that by entering, by having to enter a username and the password. And that's, that's cool because key gets, it's, it's, it's a bit more secure, right? Because for one attacker has to guess both the, <coughs> the username and the password. For, for other, you can't really use traditional offline brute forcing techniques for brute forcing that. Uh, yeah, if anyone has uh, any doubts when you go back, back home, remember this is a be beginner's workshop, right? If anyone has any doubts when you get back home, which setting to choose, choose VPA2. Choose VPA2 at home. Uh, you will not be easily able to set up the last one. Choose VPA2 and it uh, is gonna be fine. Choose a hard password though. Right, the network layer then. Network layer is layer number three. It goes after layer number two. It is responsible for addressing and routing between devices that are not locally attached. Meaning, we can have a switch in between. We can have the whole internet in between. We can have routers in between, of course. <coughs> the most popular protocol the most recognizable protocol for the network layer is, of course, IPv6. Okay, IPv4. Uh, so, IP protocol. It uh, decodes as internet protocol. Ta da! The internet. Internet protocol, of course, uses internet protocol addresses, IP addresses, uh, to address. And IP addresses have to be globally unique, for sure. Except North Korea, they just take them randomly. Seriously. <laughs> and then, then <laughs> and for the couple computers that they have, then they can't access some stuff because their national sysadmin uh, chose the wrong addresses. <coughs> right, uh, so you can read the academic defini definition on the screen. Uh, let me walk here so everybody can read it. IP addresses are assigned hierarchically. Uh, meaning that, uh, let's say, this camp. Actually, I, I had I had so much work. I haven't even looked at at the IP setup here. I, I'm just an end user uh, this year. Uh, but I guess do we have real IP addresses here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, that was the thought. Anyway, uh, so the camp got uh, some some part of IP space, IP address space, and each of us is getting some smaller part, one address of all the space. So it's hierarchical system. There's a network part and a host part for IP addresses. We're gonna take a look at that soon. And then there is IPv4 versus IPv6. Mm. V stands for version. Good question. What happened to five? It never happened. <laughs> uh, right, IPv4, uh, so the thing is, uh, I don't actually, I'm not sure, but I think IPv4 isn't actual version four. Uh, I think IPv4 stands for four bytes per IP address, but uh, IPv6 doesn't have six bytes per IP address, it has much more. Uh, but addresses are by far not the only difference between IPv4 and IPv6. It's a completely different protocol, but check this out. Applications still work. Even though we have a bit different TCP and UDP protocols on layer four, layer five and up, same stuff. So that's great. But somehow we still haven't deployed IPv6 too, too far. Right, uh, those of you who have laptops, so you can continue look at them. I'm not gonna show anything right now, we're gonna get back to that later on, but you can continue looking at Wireshark. You might already recognize some of the things I'm talking about. And to do that, if you set up the screen as I showed before, on your left on your screen, you will see those dissectors. They match layers approximately. Actually, you know what, I, I have to show this so everyone understands. Uh, and then we get back to IP addresses. Any questions so far? Oh, I can't run uh, Wireshark without sudo. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, it's it's a quick fix, as I said, with some risks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I could do a workshop on Wireshark setup, but it's a different workshop, and it would take one hour. And I'm I'm sorry about that. Uh, okay, so here's my test pickup file, or it's a, w it's a live capture, doesn't matter, let's take a live capture here. Here it is. 
uh, you can you can note that I pressed this button here and it magically started capturing. So you already see you already see some IP addresses here, some IPv6 addresses. We haven't looked at them yet. Um, you also can see some MAC addresses. Those are not here, but you can see them here. Uh, and the thing I wanted to show you right now, why I have it on the screen, is because in Wireshark, it's just the other way around. User is on the bottom, and the wire is on the top, right? So this is, well, it's not layer one, but this is layer two, this is layer three, layer four, and layer five and up in this case, right? This is the way it goes. <coughs> we don't have layer one in Wireshark. Uh, because uh, that would take quite expensive network adapters to get that information and what's more important, it wouldn't be useful at all. Uh, well, it would be useful if you're doing layer one research and attacks on layer one. So I guess some people have that, that equipment, we don't. Um, so instead of having layer one here, what Wireshark does is it puts all the metadata instead of layer one. So we see where it was captured, what kinds of encapsulation, when, it arrived, uh, the frame number, sequence number, the length. So it's, it's basically metadata instead of layer one. But we don't really need layer one for most work, including most security research, including most network security research. We don't really need, need layer one um, here. So it starts at layer two here. So again, I want to show you this so you know, and it's easier for you to follow. Layer two is here, and then three goes down, four goes down, five goes down, and so on. Okay. Uh, let's get back to the presentation then. And meanwhile, you can uh, keep clicking around and seeing what you see. Okay, so that's an example of an IP address, IPv4 to be specific. Uh, usually when people talk about IP addresses, they mean IPv4 IP addresses because uh, that's a de facto protocol for layer three on the internet. <coughs> IPv4 is divided into five classes, A to E, and uh, A, B, and C are generic classes assigned to organizations. D is a special class and E is a special class. D is used for multicast, which is actually, which could be a topic for separate worship. It allows you to send information to multiple devices at the same time, yes. Thank you for the question. We're talking about the class and we have a slide because of D and E, to understand that those addresses can be used for normal purposes. But of course, we're gonna be talking about uh, classless routing. <coughs> so, as I was saying, class D is used for multicast purposes. You should not, and I would guess you cannot in large enough deployments use those addresses and it won't work. Uh, class E is used for R&D, research and development. Those work okay on most, uh, on most applications, uh, even though normal people usually just create a closed network with whatever addresses they want from A, B, and C to, to do their research. Because responsible research is not connecting it to the internet, otherwise your new application, uh, Kronos or whatever, might get leaked and then you get in trouble. <coughs> okay, um, so final thing for this slide is A, B, and C was back then, uh, back uh, 15, maybe, oh, it's 20 years ago now, uh, used to actually decide how much computers can we put on the network, on one layer two network. But it's not so important anymore. That's why we had three of them. Uh, <coughs> currently, it's not being really used. <laughs> currently, what's being used is classless routing. And I mentioned briefly before two things. I mentioned uh, the network part of an IP address and the host part of an IP address. Here it is. The red is the network part, and the white is the host part. In this specific example, The network part is responsible for identifying which network, which layer three network 
is the device on. The white part, the host part, identifies which device on that network is being addressed specifically. And uh, this is written in bits here, in binary, ones and zeros. Why? It's because that is how calculations can be done until you learn to do it automatically in your head. <coughs> network address of any network is network part plus all zeros. So in this case, <coughs> if we have this IP address and we put all zeros here, we get the network address here. And if we convert that back to binary, sorry, that's net mask. <coughs> Never mind. If you put all zeros here and we take this number and we convert all of these four parts back to decimal, we get 216391106 and here we get 160. Because we have 128 here, we have 32 here, here and that's it. And that's 160. If you don't know what binary is, put down a note. Later on, go to Wikipedia. It's fun stuff. Well, not really, but it's, it's useful, really. <laughs> Broadcast address. That's the address used to address all the devices on the network. That's when you put all the ones in the white part, in the host part. Again, same stuff applies. When you do this last one, you get 128 plus 32 plus 8, sorry, plus 4, plus 2, plus 1, uh, which is 167 for this specific network. Classless interdomain routing notation, uh, 29. What does 29 mean? You might notice that net mask, which is actually what indicates which part is red, which part is blue, is starts with all ones and then zeros. It always does that. Mathematically, it doesn't have to. Uh, in real life, it has. <coughs> and we could, uh, if we write it down that way, we have all these ones here, right? And it's 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 a waste of space. We have this 255, 255, 255, and then usually zero. Much shorter way to write it down is sitter. We just write down how many ones we have. In this case, we have 29 ones. And the same thing is saying uh, slash 29 as 255, 255, 245, 248. To, in order to understand networks and work with networks, you need to know both notations. Depending on the tool you're using, you might be required to input or, or the output would be in one or the, or the other form, right? Some more special IP addresses that you might see when working with Wireshark or other network tools. All zeros. That's, uh, yeah, so all zeros. Um, that means default route in most settings. It may mean something else in other settings, but basically it, it talks about the default route. The device on your network where all data should be sent if your computer doesn't know where to send it. That is the default route for, for end devices. Then we have loopback address. It's actually uh, loopback network is uh, 12700. Uh, loopback address is 127001. For most operating systems, anything will work uh, in, in, instead of one. Loopback address is used to address your own device. So let's say you're on the server. If you try to connect to this IP address, then you will uh, connect to the device itself. By the way, I'm I'm running this cool challenge. Uh, I've been running it for uh, five years, I think. It's uh, hold up. Let me let me make this larger. Gonna need this. Right. Um, so my email is uh, sha2017 at kirills.org, right? <coughs> uh, the first one who sends me the root password to server back uh gets a mate, right? Okay, let's, uh, let's let's take some time to set it in. <laughs> okay, we got we got one person following. That's good. Right. So basically, of course, you can set an IP address to a DNS entry to to, to loop back. 
which means that uh, depending on the computer that you are using to connect to this address, you will get the you will get the same computer that you're on. And uh, finally, we have all ones. This means all nodes on the current network. So we can use the broadcast address here. Oh, I'll put this down. We can use the broadcast address here for the specific network. If we don't know or don't care which network we're on, we can use all ones. It is the broadcast address on the current network. That's how you write it down. Uh, most tools will not accept this form. You cannot, you cannot use this. Um, in Windows, by the way, I think there are multiple ways to write IP addresses. I haven't used it for some time, but you can use decimal form. You can like take all 32 bits and write it as a huge decimal. And and it will work. You can you can try it out. It worked in Windows 98, which was where uh, when I last used it. Uh, it should work still, I guess. Why not? Last slide about IPv4. Currently, it's still the case. There are some other IP addresses which are reserved. On the open internet, you will not find these three ranges. These are private IP addresses. And because IPv4 addresses are so scarce, we need those private IP addresses uh, because we are lazy, bad people who don't want to adopt IPv6. We are using uh, these private IP addresses. And we have what's called NAT, Network Address Translation, meaning that for conferences that suck, you get one IP address and everything else is private, which means you cannot directly connect to every computer on the network which, in other words, is why you should have firewall on when on the conference network, because the internet knows you're here. <coughs> right, but having these as private IP addresses also means they do not route normally on the internet. If I am at home and I type, and, and some conference has private IP addresses, say 10.10.4.3, if I type it at home, it will not route because it's a private address and it doesn't go uh, through routers under normal configuration. <laughs> okay, next. Yes, please. Uh, research network range is disallowed in public? No, I think it's not. I think it's not because it's not assigned to anybody, meaning that routers do not, don't know where to route it. You, you would send it through the default route up upstream, and then when we get to BGP routing, it would it would drop it. <laughs> okay, ARP. By the way, uh, those of you who have, who have Wireshark open, up up in the line where filter is, you can type in ARP three letters and press enter. Uh, some of you or most of you may see something if you've been capturing for some time. This, anyone anyone got something there? Yeah, we have something good. Um, so the filter, it's more, more, much more powerful than just typing in the protocol. Uh, but currently, you filtered all the data units that contain the ARP protocol, or, or rather that terminate in ARP protocol, where the highest layer is ARP. ARP is a protocol that does this, basically. You have an IP address. You go to the MAC address. Why do we need that? We need this because, uh, well, humans don't really work with IP addresses either, but we get to that later. Uh, so you have an IP address, but on the local segment where you are, and in the local segments between the huge route that is the internet and the connection that you're making, we need to know the MAC address. Remember encapsulation? User types their email, it goes down, it goes to layer three, there's an IP address. It is added at that point in the header. And if it goes to layer two, computer needs to add the MAC address if it's Ethernet. In order for computer to know the MAC address of a different IP address, it uses ARP. It, it asks around, who has this IP address? And it only works on local network. And a device that has that IP address responds and says, OK, this is my, this is my MAC address. Yes? What if you both have the same address? If you both have the same MAC address? Okay, okay, let's look let's take a look at that. Let let's say uh, the most interesting case here is let's say you bought okay, uh, the country in the east, right? China. Uh, let's say you both bought these cheap Chinese devices and you have the same MAC address, which shouldn't happen because uh, OYs are assigned by IEEE, but 
some companies just take it at random. Uh, <coughs> both of your devices will think that it's addressed to them, and the first one to respond will actually be the one that computer registers and puts in the ARP table. Oh, my, mine does. Uh, well, semi-random doesn't really help because uh, let's say you want to leave the first three bytes the same and you want to randomly change the uh, last three bytes. Some other person's network might actually have that MAC address because the vendor has assigned it to someone. <coughs> With random IP addresses, there is this risk that you might run into similar, uh, into equal MAC addresses. Uh, sorry, I said IP. With random MAC addresses, there is this risk that you might run into the same MAC addresses. Uh, but then you just, uh, if, if stuff doesn't work, you just... Uh, that takes the next MAC address, uh, right? <coughs> but anyway, the other case is when the IP addresses match. Uh, you know what? I, I made a mistake there. So <laughs> the explanation I gave to you was about IP addresses. If two computers have the same IP address, the first one that responds with their MAC address is the one that goes in the table. If two computers have the same MAC address, uh, well, we have a problem because they both of them think that that uh, they are it's for them. They're both responding, and we have this extra traffic all the time. And depending on the timings, each time a different frame uh, might be picked up by the destination. What you can try it out: create a test network. Uh, there's equipment all around. Don't use the equipment connected to upstream. Don't <coughs> screw it for people who want to use the internet. Uh, <coughs> Uh, take take some switch somewhere, connect a couple computers, or co-organize, and, and try it out. <coughs> this ARP thing, the first one, right? Having different IP addresses, uh, having different MAC addresses under the same IP address can actually be used for attacks, right? Um, I think we have a slide in there later on, but basically the idea is, uh, let's say you want to attack someone, and you want to in a simple case, make sure that when they connect to this IP address, they talk to you. you. You just have to be super fast, you have to even be preemptive, and you have to send ARP reply to them saying, this IP address is me, not, not that guy. And the computer will believe it. There's no encryption, no verification, no signing for ARP. And to verify that, you can actually use Wireshark and you, go inside, you can go inside ARP, you can click on it and you can expand all the fields that are in ARP, you will see there is no such thing. Uh, yeah, that's uh, what, on your computer? <coughs> so, remotely modifying the ARP table is just that. You send the ARP reply and it does that. If it's empty at that point, if the IP address is not in the ARP table. Um, luckily for an attacker, ARP table is being flushed, uh, well, entries expire in ARP table quite regularly, <laughs> meaning that you have enough options to do that. Uh, to locally modify the ARP table, you use the command ARP. I think it's both on Windows and Linux and, and probably Mac too. Uh, so you can use that to modify it locally. And I do appreciate your questions. If you have questions, please go ahead and, and ask them. And I'll try to remember to repeat them because I, I forgot that all the time. <coughs> ICMP. Um, Internet Control Messaging Protocol is a management protocol. Um, it is used in conjunction with IP to inform the source of the packet that something went wrong. Here are some examples. TTL means time to live. And it's implemented inside uh, IP protocol to avoid routing loops. Each time a packet crosses a layer 3 device or a router, the TTL field, and you can find it in an IP packet. You can type IP in search and, and take a look at some IP packets that you have. <coughs> Every time it crosses a router, TTL gets decreased by one. Uh, the initial value depends on the operating system that you use. It's usually no more than 32. <coughs> and if you cross the number of routers that you have TTL set to initially, then uh, your packet gets dropped by the next router, and Router creates an ICMP packet saying TTL exceeded and sends it back to, to the source, knowing that there was either a routing loop or the packet was too um, either a routing loop or the route was too large, too long. By the way, um, 
as I said, I, and again, I'm sorry that I, I was a bit too busy and I didn't go through the presentation again today. So I did that a week ago. And I might tell you something that's in the slides later on. But let's risk it. L rather tell you than twice than not tell you. Let me show you an example. So just to show you what routing is. So I'm specifying max hops here. So how many routers can it go through? Let's say 60 for this case. Well, uh, we can, yeah, let's say 60 for this case. Trace route is actually a bit different application. And uh, actually, um, I'm going to show you in Wireshark, it's quite interesting. So trace route is used to identify those devices that your packets go through when going for a specific destination. And it's done in quite an interesting manner. I'm going to set up the capture here. I'm going to launch the trace route. Right, there we are. It's done. So you can see these ICMP packets here. You can you can run the same on your computer, sure. You can choose different domain um, and, and run it. So a packet is sent to the destination IP address that I chose. And in IP field, TTL is set to the minimum value, in this case, 1. The first router decreases the counter and looks at it and says it's zero and sends back TTL exceeded. And this here is the first router's IP address because it is the device that sends us the packet. Uh, then my computer sends it again, but this case it says, uh, doo -doo -doo, that's probably repeat. Oh, there we go. Uh, TTL2. It says TTL2 and sends it again. In this case, I get the same reply for a different device. That way, I can get the list of routers. You can see them here. Oh, it's not repeat. It's actually route configuration this way in the network. Uh, we can get the list of routers that the packet goes through when going to the specific IP address. Uh, yes, please. If you get stars, that means a specific device is sent not to reply with ICMP to you. Or it is set to filter the specific protocol that you are sending. So here, for example, uh, TracePass uses UDP protocol on some specific ports. Technically, you can use this with any type of protocol. You can do this TTL trick. And there is, uh, what was the name? Um, HPing3, which allows you to do all these tricks. And it's uh, a bit complex, but it's fun. You can use different different type of packets to send it. Um, right. So let me show you. Let me show you one cool trace route here. If you actually go to the address bad.horse, uh, there's a cool song. Don't play it here because I need to speak, but uh, you can, if you have headphones, you can put on or play it later. It's, uh, it's, uh, these are the lyrics for the song. And that's the face the expression the guy makes at, at the point. <coughs> um, okay. Right, uh, let's continue then. So IPv6 replaces IPv4 on layer 3, creates a parallel network, which means it's not that easy to have it together with IPv4. It works with layer 5 and up protocols the same way, but layer 3 it replaces completely because it's different layer 3 protocol. And that's why it's so hard to deploy it, I guess. 
it has that many possible addresses in theory, which is, you c c can you read it for us? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, that, 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 that's fine. Uh, so it's a bit more than uh, 4 billion addresses in, in IPv4 that we have. Uh, we have one IP address for every person on the planet, every device they have, every port that device has, and every service that might want to run on every port of the device, and, and more. Um, an example of IPv6 address you can see on line 3. Was, was there a question? No? Okay. Uh, you can see on line 3. And uh, it's quite long. So what you can do, and it's a standard, in IPv6, when you type in IPv6 addresses, you can concatenate it. You can find just one. If there are multiple, you can find just one place when there are all zeros, or two bytes, two, f two bytes of the same part between the semicolons or z between the colons or zeros, and you can remove them all. So this is a whole. These all are, are zeros. We remove them and leave two colons. And that's it. And that's a bit easier. I actually a year ago I had this IP address, and then uh, six dot net shut down. It's a tunnel broker. Yeah. And I don't have any more. So yes, exactly. Uh, but but the idea, I mean, the principle is still the same. We have network part somewhere here, and we have a host part somewhere on the right. So usually, if you start your host at low numbers, you will have some zeros there, and it is actually helpful. But you have to understand this is the same address. Double the other way around. Double columns means you put in blocks of zeros until the length matches, right? Until you have. Uh, 16 bytes. That's it about IPv6. Yes? MAC addresses change No. Layer 2 stays the same. MAC addresses do not change. Thank you for your question. Okay, the next layer is layer. F oh, the question, please. Uh, you mentioned a lot of other things changed in IPv6 as well. Did I did not. Uh, well, let me show it to you. <laughs> okay, here is a uh, IPv6 magic here, and here's some IPv4. Non magic, right? <coughs> so first of all, uh, we can. Well, it's not visible here, but uh, I think the oh TCP protocol is a bit different. This is UDP. Uh, so if you look at uh, IP version six, we can see different headers than IP version four. Take a look here. Uh, the router advertisements is a new thing for IP six two. Uh, it's quite specific, to be to be honest, right? Uh, for this audience, but if we take a look, it's uh, it's 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 way different, right? Uh, again, Wikipedia. I have uh, I have a different slide deck for IPv6, but uh, we have only how much time do we have actually? One hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. Okay, one hour and a half, and we are uh, in the middle of the deck, and we have met demos, demos, demos. Huh? Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, but thank you for that. Okay, so transport layer. <coughs> transport layer, as the name suggests, is responsible for transfer of data in a reliable manner. It's responsible for the data to arrive at the destination in order and error free. And this is because IP, the most recognizable layer three protocol, is a packet switch protocol. <laughs> Meaning that the routers that we have in between two endpoints, they can switch the route that they're using for every packet. They're not bound by any law to send all your packets for the same stream through the same route. They can change like that. And that's why we have transport layer. It does some buffering, among other things, and receives uh, the packets and rearranges them in the original order. That way, if you send a long text that doesn't fit in the packet, 
you can actually arrange them back in the right order. This has to deal with TCP, mostly. Because transport control protocol, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But here, so two types of uh, layer four protocols, connectionless and connection-oriented. Uh, connectionless meaning, uh, meaning that we can just send data and that's it. We don't need to agree on anything. We can send the first packet and it's already data. Connection-oriented means we have to set up a connection in some way or another. Here is UDP. UDP is nothing what, uh, what, what layer four is about. UDP is basically there uh, to fill the void because there needs to be a layer four if you want to have layer five. It's a best effort protocol, meaning it doesn't care about errors. It doesn't care about delivering data. This is everything there is. Header consists of these four fields for UDP. And then data. Data is uh, layer five stuff coming in there. Notable features of UDP, user dedicated protocol, is minimal design, as you can see. It doesn't retransmit data if it's not delivered. It doesn't care. It just sends the next part. And it doesn't control delivery of the data either. It is stateless and transaction-oriented. So it doesn't keep the state of the connection. It's not a connection-oriented protocol. All right, the fun demo, yay. <coughs> okay, so what we have on the screen here is a theoretical setup. We have the internet in blue and brown, <coughs> the globe. We have two firewalls depicted by the icon of fire and the wall. And we have two relatively modern PCs. Um, there's A, X, Y, and B. That is the setup. Each of them have an IP address. Um, do anyone notice anything special about any of the IP addresses? Okay, which ones are the private IP addresses? That's correct. A and B are the private IP addresses. Um, so, if computers A and B would like to communicate without any third party, they would have no way of doing that. But UDP and the specific arrangement allows us to do that. <coughs> Um, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take computer A and we're going to send connection from computer A to IP address Y. Router or firewall Y will drop <coughs> will drop the packet. Will drop the UDP. Uh, the UDP. Mm, what's the actual correct term for UDP segment? Right. Will drop the UDP segment. Um, then, computer B, and the thing about this, they all, they both need to communicate. They have to know that they have to communicate. Uh, other than that, it works magically. Uh, B will send data back to A, back to X, I mean, and X will already know where to send it. Why? Because when computer A sends the data to B, a connection entry is created in the firewall X. And it says that, okay, so if A wants to communicate with IP address Y, I know where to send it back. Let me show you how it works. <laughs> okay, so I have some IP address here. Right. And I have, um, let me connect somewhere. Um, let's see, where would we connect?
Cool. Um, okay, so both these uh, computers have firewalls. Those are not private addresses, uh, but there are firewalls which will not allow to connect to them. <coughs> I'm gonna... So, the left one is my computer, the right one is my server. I'm in a different country. Um, so this command will listen for UDP packets on port uh, 2345. I forgot my IP address. <coughs> and now if I try to try to connect there on port, uh, which I also forgot, 2345, I shouldn't be able to send anything because of the firewall. Now, I hope I didn't lie to you about the firewall on the other side. Let's try it the other way around. And I'm going to try to connect from this side. Could you move the terminal a bit more to the middle of the screen? Sure. And the data doesn't go through too. It even it even sends a reset. Um, so as you see, the data didn't go through. Now, what we can do to make these two computers talk together, even though there are firewalls, in this case, in my computer's case, on my computer, and in on server case, on the network, how do we make them communicate without reconfiguring the firewalls? Um, I will now write the commands again. From here, I will connect to the server on port, say, 888, using UDP. It will not work, of course. On the server, I will not listen. Rather, I will connect to my IP address here on this network on the same port. I will also specify the source port, which the packet is coming from, which is this going to be sent from, and they match. Um, let me, uh, it's not, okay, Wireshark isn't helpful, uh, okay. Uh, we do, oh, minus U, UDP. We do this. So UDP is connectionless protocol, meaning that when I launch this, nothing has been set up yet. Only when I send the first packet will actually any data be sent. The first packet will be sent from the server to my laptop, and it will not reach it because of the firewall. But at this point, the firewall at the server side knows that server is trying to communicate on port 888, Eight, four eights, uh, with that IP address. My firewall doesn't know anything about it. Now I try to communicate with the server. I already got data through. And now, as I send this 45667, my firewall knows that I want to communicate with the server on port 8888 and will think that data coming in is part of that connection, not the other connection. There are actually two connections in, in quotes, of course, because EDP is connectionless. But now, we can actually communicate between the two devices on UDP. Yes, it, it, it can be used, and uh, uh, thank you very much for reminding me. The question was, is this one of the techniques that is used by peer-to-peer -peer networks when the endpoints are behind uh, NAT, behind network address translation? Um, it can be used, and I actually read, read some papers that say it is being used. I haven't verified it myself personally using Wireshark. Um, one part is missing here, of course, from this demo. How did the host know to communicate? And uh, one way is to use a stun server to establish the connection, just to make sure that the other part knows that you want to communicate and what port you want to communicate on, third-party server. But it's, it's not as fun. But it's, it is what, uh, what most peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, programs use. They use a stun server. <coughs> There's actually research, and it's been finished, it's, it's, it's done, uh, that allows you not to use any third-party service at all and let the other party know that 
uh, you want to communicate. I don't have a demo for that. Uh, you can uh, you can Google it. It's Pwnat, P W N A T. It's it's implementation of this. Basically, the basic idea go goes like that. Um, a host is pinging a non-existing IP address. In the paper, it's one, two, three, four. Um, and the other part, the other host that wants to communicate, at any time sends ICMP reply saying something like saying, for example, uh, "Sorry, this IP can't be reached," or "Or sorry, time to live exceeded." And routers and firewalls will send that reply through because they think it's a legitimate reply to your uh, pings to trying to connect to one, two, three, four. And that way, you can pass data on, you can initiate the connection, you can get the data running. Okay, if there are no more questions here, uh, let's look at the more complex protocol TCP. TCP is stateful and connection-oriented, meaning it preserves states between different packets. It, it uh, has some information, and the information stays there during uh, the communication. It has quite a lot of possible header fields here that can be filled. But notable features include, I'm going to start from the bottom, flow control, <coughs> meaning the other, the other device can inform uh, the sender that it needs the sender to go slower or faster. There are different devices that use IP. Uh, nowadays, especially nowadays, we have fridges, we have light bulbs, and we have laptops. Right, laptops too. Uh, <coughs> and uh, they process data at different speeds. And that's why flow control is so important, especially nowadays. Uh, order transfer, meaning that this actually implements the solution to the problem of packets arriving at different order. We have a uh, sequence number here that's responsible for order transfer. It's 32 bits. Um, it has error detection. It has a checksum here. And it has acknowledgement number here, which includes the sequence number plus one of the packet that was received. That way you can already tell your uh, communication partner, your other device, that you have received the packet. <coughs> and it has three-way handshake, which is the way to inform the other party that you want to communicate and establish the initial connection. This is a three-way handshake right here. And we're going to take a look at it in Wireshark, just to learn a bit more about Wireshark. Um, so the client uh, will send a so-called syn request, synchronization request. Server will respond with ACK and SYN. Client will send SYN, and then we will have ACK from the server. Uh, let's take a look at that live. <coughs> okay, I'm gonna go to google.com with telnet on port 80. And that's it, I'm gonna close the connection. Oh, sorry. Yes. I have no idea. Uh, is it possible? Yeah, please, please find out. We need uh, warm and cozy in here. We can get the campfire maybe going. Uh, that would be warmer. Okay, good luck with that. Um, <coughs> uh, there is some space over there. If you come with a chair and, and over there. Um, okay, so let's continue. <laughs> that is quite interesting, yeah. Nice, nice. Thank you, a round of applause. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, there's too much stuff in here. Let's, uh, let's do this again. So I'm gonna run this. I'm gonna connect to an IP address so I know how to filter it later on. And that's it, I'm gonna stop the capture.
Oh, now when I know how to filter, it's not here. Okay, so <coughs> one more cool feature of Wireshark that uh, even professionals out here may not use, may have forgotten or never knew, um, is how you can nicely filter. So, of course, here you can type in different expressions like TCP or UDP, right? But that's not what we want to do. Uh, what we can actually do is if we choose any field here, for example, the destination address, and we right click it. What we can do is apply as filter selected. And we only get the matching packets where this field is set to this parameter. <coughs> we want it we want to see both parts of the communication. We change that to IP address, not IP destination. Here is our three way handshake. <coughs> and I of course encourage you to follow through and, and also try to connect somewhere and capture it. We can see that Wireshark has helpfully already selected, uh, I mean, highlighted the flags of these three packets here, SYN, SYNAC, and ACK. But let's go in a bit deeper. So, Internet Protocol version 4, flags. Oh, sorry. Um, no, it's not, not flags. Um, that's it, huh? Oh, right. My bad. TCP, right. TCP, TCP flags. These are all the possible flags that you can set. Flags are actually two byte bytes large here on the left, you can see it. And uh, you can set any combination of flags in theory. Uh, in this case, you we have set the SYN flag, meaning it's a synchronization packet, meaning this IP address here wants to establish a connection to this IP address here on this specific port. Right. The thing I haven't mentioned about layer 4 are ports. Both UDP and TCP have ports, meaning those are channels for communication over the internet. We have the same IP address, we can have multiple services. Port 80 is typically used for web, so HTTP. Port 443 is typically used for HTTPS, so encrypted HTTP. Uh, source port is usually assigned randomly by the operating system, unless you specify it manually like we did with NC minus P. Okay, um, so we got the response here. It's, it has SYN and ACK set. And if we pay attention here, uh, those are relative sequ sequence numbers, not the real ones, but uh, sequence number here set to zero. And in our reply here, Acknowledgement number is set to 1, meaning that packet 0 was successfully received by the server. And here, it's sending, again, it says 0, and we acknowledge it 1, saying OK. And at this point, we can start exchanging data. At this camp, there's actually a project being run um, that uh, allows you to scan the whole internet. Uh, it's it's nothing new technically, but I mean the good thing is there's there's a guy who manages it and actually works with the requests you send in and and runs the scan for you. Uh, Zmap is a tool that can be used for doing that, and Zmap is internet-wide scanner. It scans the whole IP for address space in 45 minutes I on a gigabyte on a gigabit connection. If you have a faster connection, you can use Zipier or Zmap that does it even faster. Um, it's actually quite a relatively new breakthrough. I think it's three or four years old, the idea. And it allows you to do that because you are not waiting for the reply. So how it works, simplistically, is it sends SYN packets and masses to all the IP addresses in a specific pseudo-random order. And it uses the metadata, the other parts of the TCP header, to mark that these packets, uh, that the replies to these packets would belong to the scan. And it doesn't store any information on your computer about what was sent where. All it stores is an index, how far are we in the list of IP addresses. 
And when the reply comes, it analyzes those that metadata included, and it can tell you if the port is open or not. So it's quite quite cool. I'm not going to run it here because I don't have Ethernet connected, um, but it is it is a cool feature, and a way you can use knowledge of your of networking to create cool stuff. Okay, routing. I mentioned that time to live is decreased with every hop, with every router that you cross. Routing decisions are taken based on the routing table. For your computer, usually you would have just a default gateway, just one router where all your information is sent to. For internet routers, it's not uncommon to have many different routes you send your data to, and routing table is used there to actually route the data to the correct path. Three types of routing, static routing, default routing, and dynamic routing is what I want to talk about briefly here. Static routing entails manually setting up routes on each router. So let's say you are Google and you want to set up your routers. You connect to each of your, of your routers, I guess, in the thousands, hundreds of thousands maybe, and you set up the routes by typing, if IP address is in this network, send it to this router which doesn't scale really well, but it's easy in the sense that you don't have to know much. Just have to understand basic stuff about IP networking. Default routing is when you set, uh, if, if, is when you set the destination address to all zeros, and it includes the IP address that, the IP address of the router that you want to send all the data to when you don't know where to send it. This is the only thing that is usually used on a laptop. Uh, on on an end device on a computer. So we have some link local address in the last line. We can ignore that. That's a, a bit different topic. <coughs> so here, it replaces uh, zeros with default. It's actual zeros in there. Let me see if I can get it on the screen. Nope. Okay, there we go. So it says... Oh, that's a fun... I wonder if it's, if it's an Easter egg of the network team. Basically, it says, by default, you will send everything here. Unless, of course, it's in your network. Lots of data here. We only want to look at the wireless adapter. It has this internet address. This is the net mask, slash 19. If the device can reach the IP address locally on the same network by using the mask that I showed half an hour earlier, it will send it directly. It will do an ARP request, ask for a MAC address, and send it away. If it can't, it will use the default route. What else do we have in the routing table here? <coughs> we also have here information that, uh, that I just talked about. If your stuff is on the same network, do not route it. Send it directly. And here, this is the Easter egg, I guess I don't... Anyone know what that is? I, I, I seriously don't know the second line. Basically, I can tell you what it says. I don't know what the meaning of that. So it says that if you want to send, if you want to send data to this specific one IP address, you should also route it through the same IP address as everything else. Um, it, it's set by the DHCP from the network team from NOC. So I don't know what's that about. Unless someone's hacking me, then that's cool. Sure. Okay, any questions here so far? One hour? Okay. Dynamic routing. That's the coolest way and basically the only way to do large scale network deployments. It dynamically updates the routing tables on the router using routing protocols. Um, so basically, two types you should know about. Just real quick, because it is, again, a very in-depth thing, not suitable for a beginner's workshop. Uh, but uh, distance vector protocols determine 
that the route that uses the least number of routers is the best route to use. It just tries to dynamically find out what would be the number of hops to each network destination. Uh, some protocols there are RIP or IGRP. Um, SPF or link state protocols use digital metrics and they try to recreate the topology or uh, the picture of how all the network looks like visually on each router. They can also take network congestion into account when making routing decisions. Uh, for example, OSPF uh, would be uh, one of such protocols. And uh, these protocols are usually why you might have one packet going one way and the other packet going a different route because congestions and different parameters change and routers or multiple routers might take a different decision on how to route your next packet. Oh, the fun part, finally. So we went through, we went through to recap. Layer one, um, so physical, physical. Layer two, most popular one is Ethernet on layer two. We have MAC addresses there. <coughs> They're called frames. The parts are called frames, data parts. We have layer three. Most popular there is IP protocol. Um, those are packets and they have IP addresses. We have layer four, um, which has segments and we have UDP and TCP there. And now we're up to application level protocols. By the way, I did the, uh, now as I was recapping, um, I think Wireshark tries to keep, yes, uh, not that I think I know, Wireshark tries to keep this in order. That's because uh, you can see it on the right. Uh, so the fields are actually here in the order that they come in the data unit. Since we had the four and a half network experts here, why is the destination address first? before the source address. If you look at IP, source is first, destination is then. Look at the right here, right? Destination is after source. For Ethernet, for MAC addresses here, destination is first and then we have source. It's, it's not only first, it's actually the first byte, the first bit of the frame is already destination address. Any of the network experts or any, or, or any other people here, why is that? Okay, we had we hear we heard an answer speed. Could you elaborate more? Thank you. Very good. So the answer was uh, switch. When you switch, uh, so layer two device, when you try to understand which port to send the frame uh, through, switch can do fast forwarding. It can decide where to move the frame without actually looking at the whole frame. And it has to look at it from the beginning because electrical or whatever signals come, th that's how it's ordered physically. And because we start with the destination address, not the, MAC uh, not the source address, switch can take a decision uh, dep depending on the destination address without reading too much bytes from the packet. And it is much faster and it's still quite important these days with all the speeds that we have. Okay, uh, where were we? Right, so we are up to layer five, and this is the place where where I will will stop going through the layers. I will try to to do some explanation of differences between uh, session layer, presentation layer, and application layer. But it is usually hard to distinguish which is which, and Wireshark dissectors do not try to do it usually. They usually just have one layer there. Uh, what we can do now is we're going to take a look at some core protocols for the internet, core application la layer protocols, and shortly look how they work, which is the last missing part for you to understand how basic stuff on the internet works, technically. So this here is the overview of the DNS system or domain name system. Um, it consists of the roots root zones. An example of root zone would be .com. Well, not .com, com. Or LV, or NL, or uh, horse, I guess. Cool domains we have these days. Um, it's a hierarchical system, meaning that um, 
meaning that if you have a domain signed.bad.horse, it is a subdomain of bad horse, and that is a subdomain of horse. And it entails some administrative features. Before we look at that practically, and those of you um, who already know this theoretical stuff, the command is dig. I'm just going to remind you, dig. You can start playing around with it if you have it on your computers. <coughs> so just some of the DNS record types. What is DNS? Domain name system allows us to not use IP addresses. We already learned how can we avoid using MAC addresses, but people don't want to type IP addresses. They don't want to type IP4 addresses, even less they would like to type IP6 addresses. So we have DNS, which provides nice readable names for us. Computers uh, have basically no use for them. It's, it's all for us humans. There are different record types in, DNS, in the DNS system. The main record type is A or four A's and returns an IP address for domain. Okay, so if I dig A for SHA 2017 org, I will get the answer. This happens automatically whenever we use an application that supports DNS, which is 99.99% .99 of the applications these days, uh, we just type in it in a browser or in an email program and we'll find the IP address for you automatically. For an email program, the procedure is a bit different. So for a browser, it will look for a record and will know this is the IP address I need to send my data to. Let's take a look at uh, Wireshark for a moment here. So if I even if I just ping, which is just sending an ICMP packet to check if the IP is up, mm. it will still need to find out the IP address out from the name I typed here. So if I type DNS here, I will see a query here. It's asking for a record for gmail.com and the response here. And it has given me here these answers. So these are four of the IP addresses that my computer can use to connect to gmail.com. MX is used for uh, mail exchange, and that is the one used when actually sending an email. So if we dig, if we dig MX uh, Google.com, this is the answer section. We can see that email for at Google.com is handled by any of these mail exchangers. And if we would like to connect to them, we would need then uh, to get the A record for them, right? And uh, depending on the configuration, you might also get them automatically from the server, which, is, which has happened here. It's additional section. It's not what I asked for, but it might be useful. Oh, I skipped AAA, but uh, I think you already see what that is, right? Uh, four A's is IPv6 address not IP4 address. NS record is a name server record. It delegates a zone to use a specific server for lookups. Um, so here, for example, uh, every DNS resolver knows of 20-ish root servers. There are distributed all around the globe but it's basically the one and only part of the internet that is actually the weakest link. Uh, not really decentralized, even though we have 20 ish of them, if a hacker, a bad actor, well, yeah, if a bad actor, right? Hackers are good. If a bad, uh, seriously though. <coughs> yeah? Okay. If a bad actor were to take all of them down at the same time, DNS would not work globally. That's the centraliz centralization point there. Anyway. Each of these servers know, they know where to look up the first, the top level domains. So um, if we do digns, sha2017.org, and if we ask this question to one of the root servers, oops, sorry about that. 
So I did that by, by typing at and the name of the server or IP address of the server. All it will say to me in this case is which name servers are responsible for dot org. Even if I ask not an S but I ask A, I want the IP address of this, it will still give me only the same answer in authority section. Because the system is hierarchical, those name servers do not know anything about this. Let's use uh, program.sha, which is a very dear address to me. Uh, today I spend, uh, spent four hours trying to fix the, the program, CSS. Some people couldn't scroll to the right and didn't see tau and pi. Um, <coughs> okay, so we can see the name servers, and what would automatically happen if we didn't specify a specific name server, it would then ask that one of randomly one of the next name servers the same question. And we would get an answer, hopefully. If it would, if it would not get an answer, it would try the next name server. Um, so we have an answer, and again, it's not our answer, it's just an authority section that says, for this domain, ask any of these name servers. We take one at random, we ask the same question, there's our address. It's a C name record, canonical name, an alias. It says basically it says DNS for this is the same as DNS for this. And again, automatically server al also sends me. By the way, you probably will wanna know the A for this, so here it is. So I don't have to ask it again. Yes. I see you're domain. To, to what domain? Uh, to yes. Domain yes. Domain. Yes. Well, I'm not. I'm not the sysadmin. I'm the content team. So sysadmins are doing that. <laughs> uh, but uh, well, it it doesn't it doesn't have any it doesn't cause any technical difficulties as far as I could uh, imagine. So it's actually fine to do uh, I think it's fine. Now that you asked, I'm getting a bit suspicious about okay. if it's fine to do that. Uh, but I I would I would also do that if if needed. Yeah, sure. I mean, unless you have really good reason to use a C name, uh, depending on your name server, it's better to use a record directly. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can use it. Why why you could avoid C name in situation is because it's on the same domain. This zone, uh, the server holding this zone knows the IP address you can send directly. Depending on the server, you might force your DNS client to make a separate request. If I wouldn't have this line here, I would have uh, my, my I would have to now do do this. To get the IP address, which is bad. Yes. Sorry, I should have clarified. I just noticed uh, what address you're querying. I think it's not fine to do this when you're doing a C name from a for a different domain. So let's say you are uh, doing a C name for uh, OHM, and then you C name to SHA. But I'm not. Really sure Thank you. Uh, so your your comment was that. Uh, you think it's not okay to do that if CNAME goes to a different uh, upper domain? Yeah, so that's uh, that's what you said. Um, well, that's actually this this thing when you put CNAME to a different upper domain, um, say to Google.com, uh, is actually the uh, the only real use for CNAMES. It is it is not good network-wise because you will have to make another request because this specific name server doesn't know anything about Google.com. But it's it's a legitimate use. Um, it's a, it's it's a legitimate use because that way you can actually um, you can actually link your IP address to whatever this other IP address is. The other admins change the IP address and yours changes too. Unless you want to delegate the whole zone using an S record. Now we have exactly one hour left. Thank you. One hour left. Okay. PTR is a pointer. Unlike CNAME, which we already discussed here, uh, PTR would stop the processing, meaning that it's basically a kind of text record. Not exactly, but it returns just the name. PTR most commonly are used in reverse DNS. So when we did this trace route, mm, trace pass, bad horse. You, you can notice that we get the uh, names here, but if you watched carefully, Traceroute uses this TTL trick, and those are IP addresses, of course. We are getting answer from an IP address, not a domain name. What that means is that this som somehow this gets here. If we run, run trace pass minus n, it doesn't do DNS queries. We can see all the IP addresses here. And what it does is actually looks for reverse 
DNS for every IP address. Um, you can also do it like that, right? You can you can take this, which is just IP address with all the bytes in reverse order. You can dig it. And here it is. It just it's just a string basically. If you if you just dig it uh, dig any to still return it, it, it would not try to resolve it. And that of course means that you can type any domain you want in there if you have DNS server. Are all of those IP addresses uh, public? Uh, yes. But it's uh, I mean yeah it is hard to get IP IP4 addresses now. Uh, I when I was running a large network, uh, I think I just got uh, around 500 IPs just because of downtime. I, I I emailed them and said, "Come on, what's up with downtime every week?" And they said, "Okay, okay, don't be angry. Here is 500 IP for addresses, and now I have them." But this is bad horse isn't mine. It's it's someone else. Um, okay, so we already looked at dig. This is a reference slide that you can use. Um, any is a pseudo record. It's not a real record. It just asks server to send all the records it has. AXFR is authoritative transfer, um, and it asks to send all the subdomains that the server knows. Usually, this is turned off. There was this one or or maybe two times when a top level domain like dot something didn't turn this off, and and some researchers just downloaded all the domains of a country. Um, so you can you should regularly check if if stuff happens, then you can be doing good job. Um, one more thing is plus trace. Let's take a look at that. It's explained here. I already explained this process previously. How your resolver queries the root server, then queries the name server, then the sub name subdomain name server, and so on, until it gets the answer. It sends the same query to all of these servers one by one. Uh, plus trace helps you see that visually. My screen is not large enough to show it to you, but if you type in your computer's dig plus trace program sha 2017.org, I will use um, less to actually fit it on screen. Not a good idea, I guess. Okay, let's try without less. Oh, do you have internet? Yep. Let's try a different domain. Um, okay, maybe maybe I messed up. Sorry. Let's let's put it in the right place. I don't think it matters, but maybe it does. Okay, I don't know what's happening here now. It should uh, it should perform the request one by one. Mm. Right, my name server may be down. Hmm? Let's see. Yeah, it's some system D stuff. Um, dealing with it like everybody else. We need system D, right? We need the bad guys. It it unites the community. I agree. Okay, now it works. Um, <coughs> right, so this is the request to my lookup server. It gives me the root servers. Requesting one of the root servers uh, for who knows about org, who knows about domain, we get the org name servers. Then we ask one of those who knows about uh, our request, we get the SHA name servers. And then we ask those, we finally get our C name and also the A address here. So that's DNS for you. Oh, SMTP, right, the simple mail transfer protocol. It's simple, it's underlined, that means it's really simple. In the beginning, I spoiled a bit about how, how you can uh, forge the return addresses. Let me show what I mean. I'm gonna use split screen for this. Okay. <coughs> now let's say we would like to send an email to me. My domain is kirills.org. So my mail application, let's say it's a classical mail application, right? Outlook. 
um, would look up the mail exchanger for curls.org, the domain of my email. There it is. And then we need the IP address for that, technically. And there it is. What happens next is, uh, let me see if I have slides actually in the deck. Oh yeah, I have slides. Let me show you the slides first. What happens next is your computer connects to SMTP server. It's port 25, that's a well-known port. It gets greeted with uh, hello, 220. <coughs> you reply with hello and your domain name. Um, you get an OK, 250. You say who the mail is from, like some address that the mail is from. This is the envelope address. Um, you say who the mail is to. Again, you get OK. Then you send data, and then you send the email body with all the headers. Now, this here, this part here, starting from from up to subject, could theoretically be described as presentation layer, so layer six, technically. Uh, but if you don't describe that and call it whole application layer, it's not a big mistake. It, it, it's uh, quite an academic debate between those three layers. Anyway, you send that. This will be parsed by the email client, not the email server. And that's it. It says uh, OK, 250. And you quit, and it says bye bye, 221. Um, so let's take a look at demo here. So we have the IP address and port 25. There we go. Hello. Okay, pleased to meet you. Um, mail from. Okay. Uh, oh, domain doesn't exist. White hose. Oh, my bad. So some servers check more, some servers check less of what you actually type. Ah, boom. Sender OK. Good. Uh, recipient. OK, recipient OK. For recipients, most servers will actually check what the hell are you typing there. So if a domain would, uh, if an account wouldn't exist, it wouldn't accept it. Also, unless it's an open relay, it will not accept uh, email for other domains. And then data. And now this will be all parsed by my email client if I receive the email. Uh, let me try. Thank you. Okay. And you finish the dot online by itself, as it's actually said here in the message. Okay, um, and then we quit gracefully. That's basically it. Now let me fire my email client and hope that it doesn't go on screen. Okay, it's it's on my screen. That's a good sign. And uh, oh look, I have an email. It's not in spam because my spam filters suck. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna open it up for you and move it to the screen. Uh, to the main screen. I can zoom some way or, or another. Um. Okay, whatever. Let's look at uh, at headers. So this is everything received. My server added some headers, of course, additional headers that we didn't send. But basically, it's all there. It 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 says it's from Billy uh, to to admin, and uh, it's all there. Here here it is. <coughs> oh, 
Okay, so that's SMTP demo. Okay, we are at almost the last slide, so we're gonna have the practical stuff soon. Thank you, thank you. <coughs> <laughs> so, so HTTP, uh, hypertext transfer protocol. Uh, this is a protocol used to transfer web pages. It's not HTML. It's not the markup language. It's a protocol, and. Uh, Rather than doing it in Telnet, you can see how it looks here. This is a response. Rather than doing it in Telnet, let's use Wireshark to, to do that. OK. Um, so, let's run this, and let's open a web page. There we go. Remove the filter. If you filter for HTTP, we have this request here. Let's close all this, and HTTP is here. This is how it looks. So we have a get request here, meaning uh, open this page. And uh, this is page address, so basically part of URL. It says open the main page, just slash. If I would ask uh, some google.com slash 123, it would say slash 123 here. Uh, there's a host name and some headers that identify your user agent and so on. So if you want to hide, then uh, take note of that. And the response. And here's a cool trick for Wireshark. Press here on the packet and uh, follow HTTP stream. And we have the stream, we have the request and the reply at the same, in the same view. And what's even better, if we close it, we can see all the stream packets here visible. Okay. Now, what I usually do here with a group, and uh, this is a small part of a uh, five-day uh, five workshop that I do commercially, actually. Um, what I do here with a group usually is I, I get everybody to launch their Wireshark and open up a web page. It's better if it's HTTP web website, so not encrypted. Just launch Wireshark, close your browser, open it up again, open up a website. And then we'll take a look at what we see. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to take a two minute break here. You stay right here. Open up a website and I'll be back. Okay? I'll be right back. I'm going to I'm going to log this for reasons.
Wow, it's dark in here. Oh man, now you can see it. Hold on, let me let me make sure it doesn't show the password on screen. <coughs> no for the real thing. <coughs> okay, so many of you are still here, which is uh, cool. <coughs> Thank you for that. So I hope you managed. If you didn't, are there any questions before I show you it on my laptop? <coughs> the thing I want you to answer for yourself here. is what kind of protocols are involved in the simple action of opening a web page. <coughs> of just typing in an address and pressing enter. Okay, here, DNS TCP. What would be the first, the first protocol that's employed? <laughs> DNS, yes, DNS is the one you might see in Wireshark. Because you've been using the internet, or at least your computer has been using the internet. <coughs> From the theory that we covered, if you would have just turned on, your, turned on your computer, what would be the first protocol that you would see after you have successfully and fully connected to the network? <coughs> ARP. That's correct. Address res resolution protocol. Let's go step by step. And um, I'll try to simulate here that my computer is just has just been turned on. Okay. Okay. So I'm deleting some ARP addresses here. Let me re relaunch this. <coughs> okay, and now if I connect the web, I'm gonna use my favorite web browser. There I am. This is everything we have. Let's see if ARP is there. Yep. So of course we have some background data happening, uh, going on. It starts with ARP. In this case it's because I deleted my ARP table manually, but it what really happens when you start up your computer and connect to the network afterwards. <coughs> So the full explanation for this is that I typed in the domain 02.lv. My computer knows that the DNS server to use is 8888 because I put it in there manually. Now it tries to connect, it tries to do the DNS. It tries to connect to 8888. To do that, it looks at the routing table. It all happens in the background instantly. It checks the destination addresses ordered by the mask. It starts with the most, with the largest mask, and goes to, lo to the lower masks. 8888 doesn't match any of the networks. So it goes to the most generic mask, and it will send the IP packet to this IP address for routing. <coughs> In order to do that, computer now looks at the ARP table. ARP table was empty at the moment. So computer finally sends the first packet. It asks who has this IP address, which is the gateway's address. It's here. And it says I want answer here. The router, which is made by Juniper by the way, um, 
how this works, of course, by using employing a database. Remember, first three bytes are assigned to an organization, and they're trackable that way. It replies, I'm here. This is my MAC address. You can contact me there. ARP table gets populated by this information. And now, for some period of time, depending on the operating system, the length depends on the operating system, my computer will know that this is a MAC address for that IP address. <laughs> now it can finally send the request to 8888. It asks, what is the IP address for 02.lv? And what is the IP6 address for 02.lv? And it gets a response. Now what we will see here What we see here is that we get a reply who knows about 02.lv and some steps are skipped here. Meaning that Google, 8888 belongs to Google. That's their public resolver. Google does many of the steps for us and we already get the real name server that will know the answer. This one. By the way, DNS system doesn't support the symbol at. But there are emails in each DNS zones. So if you want to send spam, I hate you. So, but seriously though, if you take a look at any DNS zone, you can request any type of record. And if it's set up correctly, Oh, we should we should request start. Sorry, we should request start of authority. We can't request any type of record. If it's set up correctly, the second entry here will be the email address. First dot gets replaced by at. Of course, Wireshark does that automatically here. On the right, we can see the response here. Right. Um, then. Then to we'll ask for the IP address again. And this time we get the answer here. We get an A record. Now computer final knows the IP address of the web server. It can start connecting. Please note that for DNS, the usual layer three protocol is, sorry, the usual layer four protocol for DNS is UDP. As you can see, it's a very simple protocol just to be discussed in theory. We can see the source port, destination port, length, and the checksum here. There's nothing else. And then there's data, which Varshark already divides for us as a new layer here. HTTP is usually based on TCP. That's why we see our three-way handshake. We have SYN, SYNAC, and AC over here. And as soon as it's established successfully, and we can see the sequence numbers, of course, here, we can finally send the data. We have our layer two, layer three, layer four, and layers five to seven here in hypertext sensor protocol. There's a user agent. Each TCP packet gets acknowledged to. This data gets divided into smaller segments because it's a large amount of data and gets sent. And each segment gets acknowledged. Okay, here it says that we have acknowledged flag set. Server receives it and finally sends us the answer. This is reassembled. On the on the wire, you actually see all the separate TCP packets here. Wireshark does it for you. It assembles it back to a response. In the end, server says, please close the connection, fin. And we have handshake for closing. It's acknowledged and it's finally closed. Um, this was summary transmission. It looks like more an attack to me. So it's a hacker network, right? People are attacking stuff. Um, OK, so this is this is it. That's that. Uh, it's a bit dark to do some of the, some of the hands-on demos. Let me show you the last slide. I, I, worked, uh, I worked for two hours on the effect. So look closely, you might miss it. 
Cool, isn't it? <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm ready to take any any random questions about uh, networking or, or me or whatever. Um, tomorrow evening I'm having a talk on routing the microtic routers. This is this is one of the routers. <laughs> Yeah, hard to see. Okay, yeah. Well, that's 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 a pity. Anyway, so we're gonna we got, I'm gonna talk about jailbreaking these these boxes because you don't get root on them by default. Uh, it's gonna be in in, in no in the large tent. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions about networking, I'm here. If you want to take a look at some of the simplistic hardware I have here, you can come and come and take a look at it. It's nothing it's nothing fancy. I didn't take uh, Wi-Fi pineapple with me, for example, which is a cool, easy to use device for. Screwing with people's Wi-Fi. So yes, any any questions here? Can you download the slides? Yes, uh, you will be able to download these slides over here, uh, depending on how much work I have tomorrow. Uh, probably on uh, Wednesday. On Wednesday, go there. There will be slides. Yes. The question is, is it possible for network traffic to not show up in Wireshark? This regards capturing, so depending on how you capture. Um, if you set promiscuous mode, all the, if you successfully set it and the driver supports it, all the traffic, all the signals that physically reach your network adapter and are legible, are understandable on, on in layer one sense, will show up on Wireshark. Uh, so there are many ifs, of course. It it may not show up. Uh, it may not show up. For example, for Wi-Fi, are there any? Do we have open network for SHA? Is is there open open SHA network? There is. Oh, I'm gonna show you. There is, yeah. Insecure, the open one. Okay, I'm gonna. I'm, since we have some time, I'm gonna show you a demo after questions with with the, with the Wi-Fi, right? A small demo, uh, not not the whole thing. Uh, just just to show you how it works. But for the Wi-Fi, for Wi-Fi, for example, uh, for normal network cards. You have to choose the channel, basically the the center frequency, meaning that you will probably not see the other frequencies at the same time. So there are different ifs to to that. Yes, it is possible to for that to not show up. Yeah, I noticed this uh, one six nine two five four um, traffic doesn't really show up. Why is that? Apple won't show up on the uh, I would I would doubt that there is any traffic. It's it's a link local address. And it would not usually show up. Uh, I mean, it, there's usually nothing happening there. That's that's what I want to say. Uh, but uh, one more thing is you have all these interfaces, and similarly to as in IP, we have loopback address one two seven point zero zero point one. We also have a loopback interface on Linux and Unix machines, and loopback data would show there. So if you would do ping one two seven zero zero one. You would not see it on your ether Ethernet or, or VLAN. You would see it on the loopback only. Uh, where was the next question? Yeah. Well, uh, we capture Bluetooth traffic with Wireshark. And, uh, yeah. I haven't, I haven't tried it. Uh, thank you. The answer, the answer is yes again. And the question was, can you capture Bluetooth traffic with Wireshark? I know that a couple of years ago, uh, it was, it was, uh, there was an issue. Uh, there's Ubertooth, of course. But there was not any any sensible way to connect it. If you can now, that's great. Can you use Ubertooth for for that? Okay. Yes. So you can use Ubertooth apparently uh, to capture Bluetooth traffic. I should I should try that. That's a fun experiment. I I don't have it with me. I have it at home. Uh, you said in the beginning, if you run Wireshark as sudo, it had uh, you were hoping for some problems. What kind of problems would that be? Okay. So if you run Wireshark as sudo uh, as as super user, what kind of problems? Are you opening yourself up to? <coughs> I I did address this briefly. Wireshark has this the things called dissectors. Instead of really decapsulating and encapsulating the traffic, it uses a simulation. It mathematically tries to understand what's inside the traffic and show it to you graphically. And because of that, combined with the fact that it captures everything on wire, it's quite a high risk that if there's a bug, an attacker can exploit it easily. Because you basically you take everything up from the internet that goes to your device, that goes to your device, and a bug in one of the dissectors running as root may cause remote code execution, for example. 
Okay, any more questions so far? Yes. Um, this is my first uh, SHA or, or the previous event kind of event, right? I usually attend CCCs. I can tell you what happens to CCCs. Network team comes and confiscates your Wi-Fi device. Uh, sorry, the question is what would happen if you would set your MAC address to the Juniper's MAC address, so the router for our local Wi-Fi? And uh, I hope they have the hardware here. They have it at CCC. They they can triangulate you quite well, <laughs> or wh where you are. <laughs> they have they have hardware here. Okay. Yes. Uh, Bitcoin messages always appear in two streams, two separate packets. Uh, and what would it be a reason for that? Like the header to first uh, recognize it shows up in the first one, and then all the rest in the second one. Did you say Bitcoin? Okay, so the question was, Bitcoin messages appear in two separate packets, always header separately and, and payload separately, and what would be the reason for that? Um, I don't know. I haven't looked at Bitcoin protocol. Yeah. Yep, that's, anyone, anyone can comment on that? Nope, okay. And I don't have a Bitcoin client installed, so I can't. We c if I could, if I did, we could take a look and understand. Uh, well, the generic reason would be it's too large. The header is so large that it can't fit, but I guess it's not the case. It's not the case, so yeah. We c you can research that and there are lightning talks. You can do a small research presented day four, day five. Okay, well, uh, let's see. We have uh, 15 minutes, right? 24, uh, let's say 15 minutes. <laughs> it's been long enough, right? Um, so those of you that want to see me screwing around with Wi-Fi can can stay. Yeah, I'm not promising anything specific. I don't know what what's going to happen. Let's let's try. Okay, so here's my new Wi-Fi adapter. Okay, I want to know the frequency for for a Wi-Fi here. To do that, let me use Kismet, I guess. It's an old tool. I hope it doesn't have any bugs. If it does, I'm screwed. Oh, I don't remember all the options. Never mind. Let's not use Kismet. Um, let's do. Okay, let's just start. I'm just gonna start monitor mode on any any frequency that we have. Or I could take a look at 5.3. Oh, damn. Okay, let's ha let's hope there are 2.4 gigahertz frequencies here too. So Aero, Aeromon, and G. I'm gonna start VLAN one in monitor mode. So what I have now, I have monitor mode enabled on monitor zero. It also enables the promiscuous promiscuous mode. Uh, technically, no. Technically, it's not the same thing. So I have this interface here. I'm gonna start. Oh, and we have lots of data. So Raspberry Pi, huh? Okay, we would want to filter some stuff out, right? Let's filter out probe responses. So type subtype probe response, applies filter, not selected. We have some beacon frames. This beacon frame is saying, 
saying we have oh we have this one SHA 2017 insecure okay so we're on the right channel I guess getting some cool data well if it's not encrypted we should be able just to select TCP TCP as you know is layer 3 sorry layer 4 protocol let's select IP it's layer 3 protocol which is above layer 2 which means if I get layer 3 here my setup is able to access the data so it's not encrypted then okay so we have some data here some devices are querying badge.sha2017.org um, okay let's go deeper let's look for some fun protocol let's look for HTTP nothing no one's using the network come on <laughs> why not nice smart guys let's go back to IP <coughs> okay okay this is this is something so apparently I wasn't early enough with starting uh, to capture packets but there is a disconnect using SSH from a client so someone is using putty which is a Windows mainly Windows SSH client to access some server here Let's take a look at the server. So disconnect was sent by... I'm not sure who sends this kind of message. Is it sent... What is that? Server, is source. server sends a disconnect? Okay, let's try. Oh, we can, we can tell by the port, right? For SSH we have a TCP on top. TCP shows us the port to 22 is the well-known port for SSH, so the destination in this case was the server. So client sent the disconnect. Um, okay, so this is the server. Let's see if it has a reverse hostname set up. Technically, we can also copy it. It's not useful for small things like IP addresses. For larger, you use copy, and then you select the right selection of these things. Printable text, I think, will work this time. Nope, value was the right answer. Yep. <coughs> okay, there's nothing there. <coughs> okay, there's open search server over there. If it's in the same subnet as we are, we should be seeing it in our table. There it is. And we should be able to see the vendor. We can also see it here, of course, on layer two. Jolla, whatever that is. Okay, this wasn't fun. Sorry for that. What else do we have here? Oh, someone is trying to use TLS, which may be HTTPS here. Yep, it's HTTPS. HTTPS reply from server. <coughs> Finally, if it was one of you, thank you. So <laughs> we have something similar to HTTP. And some DNS. Okay, not much stuff going on here. There's NTP. So not not that fun. I'm sorry this is a hacker conference so people know what they're doing. Or maybe it's too late. Shall I, shall I, uh, <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I mean, we. the point is, you see it, data is unencrypted. What we would see, we would see the same kind of data as capturing our own traffic, basically, right? If the data is encrypted, there is a slide on how to attack VPA2 in one of my presentations on kirill.org go through the 50 of them and you will find it <coughs> and then you can try it out uh, if you confirm the knock okay I think one last question now yes thank you very much for your time and see some of you tomorrow I guess <laughs>